Hello, I'm Sam Myers, and I'm the Deputy Trade Commissioner for Asia Pacific, working for the Department for International Trade. I'm joined by Julian Lin and Richard Michael from UK Export Finance, and we're going to give you a short overview about the Asia Pacific region and opportunities for companies to export, including financing support available, and then we'll head to questions. Did you know that Asia Pacific is home to a billion people and 15% of global GDP? It contains four of the G20 countries and six of the top 20 for ease of doing business. I'm going to spend the next few minutes providing a brief overview of the opportunities for UK companies before we dive into the support that UK export finance can provide for you in this market. For clarification up front, Asia Pacific is defined today as Southeast Asia, the markets of ASEAN, Northeast Asia, including Japan, Korea and Taiwan, plus Australia and New Zealand. There's a separate session running now on China and Hong Kong, but our teams work really closely together across the regions and we can help you link up if needed. So Asia Pacific is hugely important for UK trade. Total trade in goods and services between the UK and Asia Pacific was £114 billion in 2019, which was an increase of 5.5% over 2018 or 5.9 billion. And just to put the Asia Pacific region into perspective against some of our larger neighbours, in 2019, total UK exports to Asia Pacific amounted to 58 billion. And that compared to our exports to China of 31 billion and India 8 billion. Because of this hugely important region and the diversity and opportunity, the UK government is pursuing an ambitious trade policy agenda, capitalising on our position as a top independent trading nation and champion of free trade. We signed the UK-Japan Free Trade Agreement in October, and Japan is the UK's fourth largest trading partner. We've launched trade negotiations with Australia and New Zealand and are making great progress. And we've also reaffirmed our intention to join CPTPP, the trade agreement involving Australia, New Zealand, Japan, as well as Singapore, Vietnam, Brunei and Malaysia within our region. 2020 has been a pivotal year for UK ASEAN relations and over the last 10 years, trade between the UK and Southeast Asia has grown by almost 70% to just under 42 billion. The Department for International Trade Secretary of State, uh, Liz Truss, co-chaired the very first UK ASEAN economic dialogue with counterparts from all member states, as well as the ASEAN Secretary General, which is another indication of our strong and growing partnership with this really exciting and dynamic part of the world. Now, of course, all of this is against the really challenging and difficult backdrop of COVID-19 uh, from a both health and economic perspective. And we've seen the impact of COVID-19 hit the global economy and also the Asia Pacific region. According to UNCTAD, globally, trade will shrink by around one fifth this year, with foreign direct investment by up to 40% and remittances dropping by over $100 billion. Now, certain markets have been hit harder than others, and the impact of the travel and tourism sector has been very significant in Asia Pacific. This sector employs over 40 million workers in ASEAN alone uh, from 2018 figures, and accounted for over 20% of GDP in Thailand, Cambodia, and the Philippines. And Despite uh, a very challenging year, over 60% of Asia is still closed to international tourists. Against that difficult backdrop, some countries have done better than others. And Vietnam's GDP growth in the second quarter of 2020 was about 0.4% year on year. Although this was the worst performance for the economy in 35 years, it was exceptional compared with its neighbours, with some suffering from negative growth. 
Now, the Asian Development Bank expects Vietnam's economy to expand by 1.8% overall this year, which is one of the very few countries where it expects growth. And Vietnam, with its favourable conditions, is a good choice uh, for those uh, companies seeking alternative destinations to diversify and reduce their reliance on China for manufacturing, for example. And Vietnam's forecast to, to have over 6% economic growth in GDP next year. So what sectors are we seeing some of this opportunity? Well, infrastructure, for one, is increasingly being used as an economic stimulus for recovery from COVID-19. For example, Thailand and the Philippine governments are prioritising their construction sectors. And we'll be hearing more from Julian and Richard shortly about the UK export finance support available across our markets. Prospects for UK life sciences and healthcare companies in Asia Pacific are generally positive especially around acceleration of digital health adaptation and new and innovative clinical diagnostic and environmental testing. We're also seeing a drive towards a greener economic recovery with plenty of opportunity in renewable energy, especially in offshore wind and solar. UK Export Finance provided almost £400 million of support for renewable energy projects last year and have an additional £2 billion in direct lending capacity for clean growth projects globally. They were recently confirmed as a top three global export credit agency for supporting sustainable finance deals. In times like this, we need innovative companies more than ever, and we can see the tech sector in particular having a key role to play in the global recovery from COVID-19. Southeast Asia registered 40 million first time online users during the coronavirus pandemic, bringing the total number of users to 400 million. And the region's burgeoning internet economy continues to grow at an unprecedented pace, surpassing $100 billion this year and being on track to cross 300 billion by 2025. Alongside this, we've seen an increase in demand in tech services from fintech to e-commerce, edtech to video streaming. And digital technology will continue to play a key role over the coming years with new supply chain technologies, including the Internet of Things, robotics, 5G and blockchain, able to dramatically improve visibility and agility across end-to-end -end supply chains. So this year, the government uh, the UK government launched the Asia Pacific Digital Trade Network to support UK tech businesses to internationalise in this fast growing region, to attract capital and talent to the UK and enhance UK digital economy collaborations with this part of the world. DTN officers uh, will be supported by Tech Nation uh, and will have a presence across the Asia Pacific region. Now that's of course just a snapshot and I hope I've been able to share some of the scale and potential opportunity in this hugely diverse, exciting and dynamic region. Doing business here does require an investment of time as well as in relationship building. But the Department for International Trade and UK Export Finance and our partners more broadly, including British Chambers and the UK ASEAN Business Council are all here to help you. DIT has presence across 13 markets in Asia Pacific. And if you're interested in specific opportunities, please don't hesitate to email apac.dit at fcdo.gov.uk. Now that's apac.dit.fcdo.gov.uk. And we'll connect you with someone who can help. So we're now going to hear a little bit more detail from Julian about the role that UK export finance can play in supporting companies wishing to sell their, com their products into this really exciting region and how they can help you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sam. Uh, my name is Julian Lin. I'm a regional head based here in London for Asia Pacific and the Middle East at UKEF. And I'd like to echo Sam's point about how exciting we see this region and the huge potential that is going on there. In terms of UKEF's own commitments, that's reflected in the fact that we're expanding our dedicated representation in markets like Malaysia and the Philippines. And as you'll hear later, we have Richard Michael, one of our first IEFEs based in Indonesia. 
we have substantial country limits for the, each of these markets that were mentioned, huge appetite and capacity. And as notwithstanding the COVID implications, we have seen a very significant uptick in engagement with our DIT teams and with clients and customers in Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Cambodia, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam, which, which Richard, uh, Sam mentioned, <clears throat> along with the Philippines, all of whom are offering significant opportunities in a variety of key sectors. And for us, particularly in renewable energy, where we're looking to build upon the success that we had in Taiwan uh, earlier this year and last year in financing three of their offshore wind farms, and where UKEF came alongside several other ECAs to deliver highly innovative financing, long-term credit offered in local currencies. Uh, and this enabled a number of UK suppliers to benefit and establish a presence in the region. Uh, furthermore, we have a number of markets there, which what we call third country collaboration, Japan, China, Taiwan, uh, where we see a collaboration between major international contractors from those countries cooperating with UK suppliers. Just to echo also Sam's point about the sector focus is clearly on infrastructure, renewable energy and transport, defence and healthcare. But there is a broad range of opportunities there. And now is the time to establish your presence and to ensure that you're working with us. and We're aware of your opportunities so we can feed those into our DIT teams uh, and they can help connect you with key buyers and borrowers and influencers in these markets. We do see uh, a significant need to help the UK supply chain and we remain ready here in the UK to do that. We have a national network of uh, export finance managers that are ready to sit with you wherever you are located in the UK and help you access our products and access these opportunities we've uh, discussed. Uh, we do recognise that in renewable energy, solar and offshore wind, a lot of UK suppliers are in the tier two, tier three category. So we are extremely well organised and focused on connecting you with key buyers and suppliers. I'd also like to echo Sam's point about UKF, I think, remaining one of the most competitive export credit agencies. And we offer a lot of flexibility uh, to both the exporter in the UK through a variety of products that we can give them as an exporter, such as working capital and bond support, right across to the sign finance that we offer key buyers and borrowers in these markets with long term competitive financing so that there is a complete umbrella of support there for you. We also are keen to do further mapping of the opportunities in these regions, and we can do that best by talking to UK exporters and connecting you with buyers and borrowers. So, as we said, we're very keen to establish contact with you and understand your needs and requirements. Finally, I would say very briefly that our key focus remains renewable energy and clean growth. Uh, we may or may or not be aware of the Prime Minister's 10 point action plan on this to create a green industrial revolution. And there's no doubt that the UK today is very well placed in a number of technical and service based areas to provide that, not just in solar and offshore wind, but also in hydrogen, carbon capture and recycling. And these are going to be key sectors for us to focus on going forward in the future. I hope this quick introduction has helped. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Richard Michael. And we look forward to talking to you and or having some of your questions and answers uh, after these uh, presentations. Richard, thank you. Thank you, Julian. And thanks also to Sam for the excellent overview. Uh, my name is Richard Michael. I'm the country head for UK export finance for Indonesia, and I'm based in the British Embassy in Jakarta. Um, as Julian mentioned, Indonesia was actually the first place in the world where UK export finance uh, placed somebody as a representative on the ground. Uh, so I have the honor of being the first, although now we, of course we have 11 others around the world, and we'll, we, we will be adding uh, Malaysia and the Philippines in the next few months. Uh, so why was Indonesia chosen first? Um, I think obviously the one of the reasons is that it's it's the largest uh, economy in Southeast Asia, has the largest GDP, uh, and 
It's the fourth largest population in the world. It's a G20 member. And currently the UK has a joint trade review uh, with Indonesia covering a number of sectors. And we're hoping that this review will actually open up the market even more to uh, UK exports and investment into the country. So uh, we, we had a, tr a strong track record in defense. Uh, that was the main uh, bread and butter, if you like, of business uh, before um, I took up the post in uh, 2017. Uh, but now we're branching out into other areas uh, beyond defense. Uh, infrastructure is a key one. So Indonesia has a lot of opportunities in the rail sector, uh, has a lot of opportunities in airports as well. There are a lot of PPPs being launched. Uh, they are creating what they call 10 new valleys uh, in more remote locations to uh, promote tourism in the archipelago. Uh, and um, there is a new capital city being developed as well in East Kalimantan. So the whole capital, capital of Jakarta will be moved across uh, in the next uh, decade or so. And that's going to present a lot of opportunities for UK companies to get involved, whether it's directly procured by government or whether it's under a PPP structure. So that could cover uh, rail, ports, airports, uh, water, wastewater, power generation, you name it. So a lot of opportunities there. We also see a lot of opportunities in the healthcare sector. Uh, there are some PPPs that have been launched uh, for new hospitals, but there are also private developers of hospitals and there are opportunities, for example, in oncology um, and uh, hazardous waste treatment for medical waste. Um, in that sector as well. But finally, uh, and this is touching on the uh, theme of clean growth that was mentioned by, by Sam and by Julian, uh, there are a lot of opportunities for renewable energy in Indonesia. So we're, we're finding there's a lot of interest in waste to energy. We actually have a seminar next week uh, for, for that. And uh, in um, other, other forms of uh, renewable energy, such as solar uh, and wind. And there is actually a case study in renewable energy that we've already been involved in. Uh, I was working with Julian on that one. Uh, there's a company called Serbodynamic in Indonesia, and they're part of the Malaysian group. And they are converting uh, diesel generation into uh, gas-fired. Uh, so it's still using a fossil fuel, but it's a much cleaner story than uh, just diesel generation. And this is being developed in eastern Indonesia. Uh, to uh, to wean uh, the electricity utility off the use of diesel. So uh, we have four billion pounds available for the country in terms of limit. And as Julian mentioned, uh, that can be deployed in terms of local currency in Indonesian rupiah, as well as in uh, the hard currencies, dollar, euro, yen and pounds. Uh, so there are a lot of projects which are denominated in local currency. You can think of roads, a lot of rail projects, water projects will probably lend themselves to borrowing in local currency, and we are the only major ECA that is offering that at the moment. So we work uh, hand in glove with our colleagues in DIT. Uh, I'm based in the embassy and I work alongside the rest of the DIT team. Uh, and we do all work together as, uh, as one uh, integrated uh, unit across the region. Um, and I look forward to talking to any of you on, on this seminar today about Indonesia and what the opportunities might be. And after this session, uh, Julian and I will be able to field any questions you might have. Thank you very much.